Paul said he forgot to mention all of the ones who came up yesterday and thanking everyone. Uh, he counted about how many there were that came up. How many? Somewhere around 10. It didn't take all that long to get everything done, and so we are grateful that for each one who came up. Uh, when you have several who work together like that, it does uh, bring about a quick taking care of the problem, huh? That was counting a few ladies as, that came as well. We'll remind everyone about the lectureship that's coming up. It's not going to be too far away. It will be upon us. Uh, we certainly want to encourage you to be making plans and to be here to invite others. Uh, be a good study. A very, I believe a pro very profitable study. God has placed within man the need to worship and as such, uh, we are worshiping beings. We are to have unity as well. Unity is a oneness, and Jesus certainly prayed for that type of a unity in John 17, verse 20 and 21, that we would all be one as he and the Father are one. Worship, when we're dealing with the subject of worship, uh, well, there. Well, worship is defined as the idea of kissing toward, uh, bringing about a uh, sense of worthiness, honor, respect toward one who is superior. When, in order to have unity, and worship or worship in unity, our worship must be directed to the Father. It must be done in the proper attitude of spirit, and it must be done according to God's word or truth. And when you have all those three things together, then you have worship and unity. There are certain things, though, that hinder that unity in our worship. We have been looking at some of those things and it come down to the subject uh, dealing with the preaching. Well, I'll get to the right spot maybe uh, at some point in time. And this isn't going to work today, it doesn't look like. Henry says, there it is, finally. I don't know if Andrew did that or not, but uh, we were took looking at uh, hindrances to unity and worship specifically regarding the subject of preaching. Recognizing that we are to preach only God's word we are to preach all of God's word, everything, in other words, that is essential for man in attaining heaven's own, with no right to change or alter that word in any way, shape, or form. But as you look at the early church, the early church was not content to remain within God's word. You had, for example, Judaizing teachers who wanted to add God's word. You had those who were like Hymenaeus and Philetus who wanted to teach that the resurrection was past already. So you had individuals who were not content in their teaching to remain within the pages of God's word. And as a result, there came about disunity, disharmony. As we go through time, we have this great apostasy that's taken place. It's really told about in St. Thessalonians, the second chapter, that it's going to come about. 
and uh, it resulted in the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, though, went so far away that people started trying to reform it. But you cannot reform something that's never been authorized to begin with. What they needed to do was to restore it. And so in the 1800s, late uh, 1700s, 1800s, you had men that come along who were trying to go back to the original to restore New Testament Christianity and realizing that a restoration of what is found within the pages of the New Testament will bring about unity. And it did for a certain time. But again, changes were starting to be brought in. You had first instrumental music along with the missionary society. And these brought about a disharmony and a disunity that caused the United States Census, at least in 1906, to recognize a distinction between two different groups now. You had those, the Churches of Christ, and you had the Christian Church. The Christian Church wanted to add those things that were not authorized within God's Word. And as a result, there's that division. After that, though, there was a period of unity again, but again, problems arose. And so last week we discussed the aspect of some beginning to teach a difference in relationship to the scheme of redemption, teaching grace only, salvation. And this morning we want to look at, and should have uh, shown that, one uh, a little bit earlier. But uh, this morning we want to look at specifically dealing with the organization of the church. Uh, that the church uh, did not remain within the organization that God set forth. And in reality, Andrew, if you would go ahead and click that. And I'll try and get some of them. The organization of the church is really what brought about the great apostasy in the first century. You had, in the first century, an elevation of one individual over other individuals within the eldership. This brought, came about many times innocently enough where one individual, there was a respect for that one individual, and so individuals started going to that one individual, and he started making decisions. They had respect for him over the, everyone else in the eldership. And as a result, you had one being elevated, a bishop over the elders, is what result, it resulted in. <laughs> Starting out innocent, yes, but it doesn't remain that way. And so you had, once uh, that took place, you had had a problem within the organization of the church, an attack upon it. But it led, of course, to 606, in which one is declared the pope over all of the church. And so that was a major factor in the apostasy that took place in the early church dealing specifically with the organization of the church. Well, within the Lord's church, now within that period of the restoration, you start seeing problems arise again within the organization of the church. And now then, instead of the aspect of so much one individual taking an elevated view upon, over the others within the eldership, now then, what we're seeing is a denial of eldership having authority. We see this because of the effects of society upon the church. And sadly, that takes place far too often. Whatever you see in, the, in society slowly starts making its way into the Lord's church. You see this in regards to this subject. 
you had within society a general disrespect for authority. That was referred to at that time as it was an anti-establishment movement of the 1960s. And that attitude of anti-establishment was seen in regards to the church as well. One of the ways in which it was demonstrated within the Lord's church was the eldership. Denying their authority within the eldership. Brother Rule Lemons, who was editor of the Firm Foundation, many referred to it as at that time the Shaky Foundation instead of Firm Foundation. Shaky Foundation probably would have been a better term for it. This was, of course, prior to the time, as you will probably well remember, in which Brother Bill Klein and uh, Buster Dobbs purchased it away from the Showalter family, and then Brother Klein became editor of it. But prior to that time, you had Rule Lemons, and he wrote an editorial dated August 2nd of 1977. It was titled, Who Calls the Shots? Now then, by the very title in which he used, you can start seeing the aspect that he's going to be dealing with. Do elders, do they have the right to call the shots within a congregation? And it was, in, a, in essence, a denial that elders have authority within the local congregation. And he took this view, as was being promoted during that time, that elders do not have any authority except by example. Well, if that's true, they have no authority whatsoever. But it was a denial of the elders and their right to make decisions in expedient matters. Now then, in reality, uh, these individuals who came up with this idea, they never would really make a determination as to how decisions are to be made then. In those expedient matters, how are those decisions going to be made? How is it going to be made as to who we support in a financial st st uh, standpoint as they go into foreign areas or those foreign areas that need support? Who makes the decision who we support, how much we support them, and things along that line? They wanted, the elders did not have that right to make those decisions. Who did then? The only real answer that came about was, what well, has to be the decision of the congregation. One man who was a former elder, supposedly, uh, stated in relationship to hiring a man to become a preacher within a local congregation that what the elders should have done they didn't do it this way but what they should have done he said or claimed is that they should have brought in a whole bunch of preachers to try out and then they let the congregation vote as to who is going to become the preacher of that congregation. Why? It again goes back to this basic premise that the elders don't have the right to feed the flock. They're not over those things. They're not overseers. They're not leaders. They have no authority. It's the congregational aspect. And so the question he asked, who calls the shots? But it was a promoting of this, and because of the backlash, he later, uh, I believe it was the next year sometime, he comes back trying to explain this and just makes the matters continually worse. But then there's a book that was published as well. 
And Andrew, if you'd get the next one. Wayman Miller wrote a book called The Role of Elders in the New Testament Church. I have a copy of it. It was the second edition. That second edition was dated in 1980. And again, in this book, he advocated that elders have no authority except by example. For example, he wrote on page 47 of that book, it is well to remember that there is not one occasion in the inspired record of a body of elders independently arriving at a decision about anything. There is, therefore, no New Testament authority or precedent for elders serving in a decision-making role for churches. Now then, that's hard to misunderstand in, in relationship to what he is advocating here. Elders have no right to arrive at decisions about anything. Anything. Doesn't matter what it is. They have no right to independently, own, that is on their own, make a decision about, doesn't matter what it is. They have no right. They do not have authority to serve as a decision-making role. Now, in, in reality, to get to that point, there has to be a denial of a lot of words that are found within the scriptures relating to elders. The very fact that they are overseers, bishops, demands that they make decisions if they do not have a decision-making role, then what role do they have? Well, his comment was, it was example. In another section of the book, Andrew, there it is. Uh, in this section that he titled this part of the book was a tenure for elders. And he wrote, there is a solution that has practical merit. It is that elders are appointed for a specific tenure, say for a period of two or three years. He goes on, at the end of the two or three year period, the church could have the option of re-electing re an elder or of not doing so as it felt his performance record justified. In the event the church did not see fit to re-elect an elder, his tenure would be terminated. In other words, this elder better meet the approval of the congregation. If it does not, then he's not going to be, using his term, re-elected as if the office of an elder is something to be elected to or not elected to, is the argument that he's setting forth. But he again sets this idea, and it's being used in many liberal congregations today, that you appoint an elder for a specific tenure, a specific period of time. He suggests two or three years. Now you can, yes, re-elect him to that office, or you can decide not to re-elect him to the office. Just make up your own mind as to which is right. If he, you think he's done a good job, then re-elect him. If you don't think he has, then don't re-elect him. Notice, though, as he begins this, he says that this solution, a solution to a problem that he invents, that's not really a problem anyway, 
but uh, this solution that he comes up to his invented problem has practical merit. In other words, there is no Bible for it. Take the Bible out of the equation because there is no Bible for it. We're only going to go by practical merit on this. Well, what if I don't think it's practical? <laughs> by the way, I don't think it's practical. <laughs> and someone else thinks it is. Who makes the decision then? We already found out elders don't have any decision making right. So it's not going to be the elders who make those decisions. Who's going to make the decisions? as to whether it is practical or not practical. You see the problems that we start getting into in these things? Shortly after this, Brother Alvin Jennings comes along. He is the owner of Star Publications. Uh, publication uh, that dealt with producing material for churches of Christ primarily. He wrote a book titled The Three R's of Urban Church Growth. Andrew, if you'll get that next one, please. It was dated in 1981. I thought it is interesting that it has an introduction by Jewel Miller. Now then, many of you will remember the Jewel Miller film strips. That's the same individual who produced the Jewel Miller film strips, wrote the introduction for this book, The Three R's of Urban Church Growth. And Later on, he revised the book, although the emphasis of the book remained the same as entitled it, How Christianity Grows in the City. That was done in 1985. In this book, he advocated one central eldership for a number of congregations. If you look at urban church growth or and why or the three R's of urban church growth or how Christianity grows in the city, he centered upon the cities, the urban areas, and said that within a city you needed to have one eldership and all of the congregations are subject to that one eldership. And in reality, all of those congregations send money to that centralized eldership. They are the ones who now are in control. Now, he didn't try to take away the authority of the elders as, for example, Wayman Miller did. But what he is uh, advocating was very simply nothing more than what we see in the Roman papacy. And, of course, here's Jewel Miller writing the introduction for that book. And Alvin Jennings was the individual, again, that is, he's the owner of that Star Publications. And, by the way, he became the only one who had the rights to sell the American Standard Version of the Bible. If you want a copy of that, you have to go to Star Publications, which he owns. So again, you start seeing problems within the eldership and that organization. Then in 1990, Dave Miller preached a sermon at Brown Trail Church of Christ on April the 8th of 1980, introducing even though he says it had been done by others, what uh, has been termed the reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders. In this, 
taking the lead really from what Wayman Miller had written, and as far as I know, there was no relationship between Wayman Miller and Dave Miller, but uh, he says, we basically vote on the eldership. And the congregation gets that vote. This, by the way, the second time that they did it, that became a problem. Because in the first time, it was very basic. If you did not get 75% approval rating, then you were out. If you got 75% approval rating, then you remain an elder. When Brother Brantley talked to Dave Miller about this subject, he asked him the, really the pertinent question, what if a man who is qualified to be an elder does not receive 75% approval rating? Guess what? That man is no longer an elder. What if a man who is not qualified to be an elder gets 75% approval rate? He remains an elder. It all goes back to the vote. That's not what they called it, but that's really what it is. Of the congregation upon the men who are going to be elders or who are going to remain elders, or whether or not they remain elders. The second time they did it, it presents a problem because someone finally figured out, well, is that 75% approval rating based upon the congregation as a whole? Or is it just the ones who return the forms? Because if it's based upon the congregation as a whole, they said none of the present elders should remain an elder. If it's based only upon the forms that were returned, then some of them would remain elders, but a couple of men who were qualified, one I know who was qualified to be an elder, he was removed from the eldership. And so which one was it? And they didn't really know at the time. In fact, it involved one individual resigning from the eldership because he had not gotten a 75% approval rating of the congregation as a whole. And then he was, I guess you could say, rescinded his resignation because it was explained to him that he got 75% approval rating of the forms that were turned in. So yeah, it was in a state of limbo in a sense. Caused division within the congregation, but in reality, what you had was something that was never authorized to begin with. It never should have been done. And sadly, some individuals will now fellowship Brother Dave Miller because of the position that he's in. But we've seen these attacks upon the eldership. And by the way, in relationship to this idea of the reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders, what you have in reality is if you want to get rid of sound eldership, just vote them out. They might be standing for the truth, but a few people in the congregation, if 26% of them you know, don't like that stand for the truth, vote them out. and that way eliminate the eldership. It leads to all sorts of problems, but it's something that has never been authorized in the Lord's cause or the Lord's work within the church and thus brings about disunity. Let's deal with one other area and that is the work of the church. Because the work of the church is very simply the saving of souls through the preaching of the gospel to the lost, through the edification, through the scriptures of those who have been saved, and then in that area of benevolence, being benevolent toward those who are 
who need help. But the work of the church primarily is that single-fold aspect of saving souls. But as we came through time, we start seeing that people altered that work of the church and started promoting, well, we need to provide recreation and entertainment for the members. And so there was the trips to Disney World or Six Flags or this entertainment area, and we're going to have the church provide this entertainment for the young people in particular, So because we have to keep the young people and we have to make things interesting for the young people. And we have to provide entertainment for them. We have to provide recreation for them. And so many congregations started building a big gymnasium. Why? Because they wanted to provide entertainment and recreation for the members. That was never the work of the church, though. And so, but we started changing that work of the church from saving souls to looking inward at ourselves and what we can provide for ourselves in relationship to these areas. But also, coming along in the same time frame, you had the idea of let's deal with the social ills of our day. And that became the focus of our preaching, or their preaching, maybe I should say, some within the Lord's church. Let's deal with the subject of pollution, nuclear weapons, or this social ill, poverty, or that social ill, you know, whatever it might be. And so whatever the social ills may be, that's what you dealt with in your preaching. Sin did not become that which was contrary to the word of God and thus a transgression of the law. Sin became these social ills instead of transgression. So poverty is sinful, but a violation of God's word does not necessarily is not sinful. It was reported that uh, Landon Saunders preached, and Andrew, if you'll get this next one, preached a sermon in which he said, quote, environmental organizations were as necessary to the church and that saving the whales was as necessary for one to go to heaven as was baptism of the Lord's Supper. Now then, Landon Saunders was the national spokesman in a, in a um, radio program called Heartbeat among the churches of Christ. In this radio program, Heartbeat, they wanted to hide the fact that they were members of the churches of Christ and you could kind of, I guess you could say, sneak up on people after they get acceptance from people and they can then sneak up on them and reveal to them that they're members of the churches of Christ. Now that was the idea that they presented in relationship to their program Heartbeat. And it was at one time, I don't know if it's even still in existence, but at one time it was a sub uh, part of Herald of Truth organization. But you can see the emphasis now. Because really this became the emphasis, these social organizations, environmental organizations, all of these type of things were as necessary in going to heaven as his baptism of the Lord's Supper. Now that became the preaching thus. But of course, the reality is that type of preaching is false. 
Now, if you go back to the first century, the first century, they had social ills during that day. There were social problems during that time frame. Great number of them. But their preaching did not center upon those social ills. In fact, to a great extent, you wouldn't even know about the social ills of that day if you were simply reading the Bible. Why? Because they were not important in relationship to the soul. The soul is what was important. That eternal nature of man. And to cure the social ills of society would not affect man's spiritual nature. Just as if we cure the problem of the environment today, whatever those problems might be or even imagined, if we solve the problem of these social change agent, really, that say, you know, climate change. It's the same people who once said, we're going to enter into an ice age. And then when that was found out to be false, well, we're going to be burning up, going into heat. And now then that they can't really sustain that, well, it's going to be climate change. Let's just say they were right, and we solved the, that problem. Is that going to affect our spiritual relationship with God in any way, shape, or form? Here's poverty. Poverty is a problem. There's no doubt about that. It, it always has been. It always will be. But let's just say, and this isn't really possible, we're always going to have the poor with us, Jesus said. But let's just say, we solve the problem of poverty. There is no more poverty whatsoever. Is that going to change man's spiritual relationship with God? It's not going to make any difference whatsoever. Can a person who is in deep poverty be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ and faithfully serve God? Absolutely can. Can a person who is filthy rich be obedient to God and serve God faithfully? Well, of course he can. Those external circumstances, whatever they might be, will not and do not affect one's spiritual relationship. And so that changing of the social gospel is what happened from the true word of God is of no value. That's why you don't really see it within the gospel, within the pages of the word of God. But this idea presented by so many is let's center upon these social ills. Let's center upon providing recreation entertainment. Let's try and solve the problems within our society instead of solving the greatest problem, man's separation from God because of sin and the salvation of that man through the obedience of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what needs to be centered upon within our preaching. And when we change that work of the church and the, that preaching of the work of the church to these other areas, you have brought about disunity instead of unity. But what will unify us is to get upon God's word and preach God's word. And only God's word as far as the work that the church is to be involved in.
Now then, if you are not in that saved relationship with God this morning, then we would encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've obeyed it, but you've fallen short as a child of God and need to be restored to faithfulness, to come back into God, then why not come as we stand and sing this invitation song?